Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker today. Kevin Blackstone is a national columnist for AOL Fan House, a panelist on ESPN's Around the Horn, an occasional contributor to National Public Radio's All Things Considered. He is also co-author of A Gift for Ron, a memoir by former NFL star Everson Walls, published in November 2009, about his kidney donation to one-time teammate Ron Springs. Blackstone is a former award-winning sports columnist for the Dallas Morning News from September 1990 to September 2006. He has also worked at the Boston Globe and the Chicago Reporter. In 1990, after covering Nelson Mandela's US tour, Blackstone moved to the sports page where over the next 16 years he covered the Summer Olympics, Super Bowl, Wimbledon, the World Cup, the Tour de France, the British Open, the NBA Finals, Final Four, a National College Football Championship, NFL Playoffs, Major League Baseball Playoffs, World Championship Boxing Matches, and other events more than once. I don't think there's anything he hasn't covered, and he's actually told me that he's headed off to the World Cup next month again. Blackstone is a recipient of numerous awards, including awards for sports column writing from the Texas Associated Press Managing Editors, a Chicago Newspaper Guild Award for investigative reporting, and a National Association of Black Journalists Award for enterprise reporting. Blackstone was a Davenport Fellow at the University of Missouri and a Wharton Business Journalism Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a Martin Luther King Fellow at Boston University. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his girlfriend and his Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, he told me, <laughs> his dog. Uh, I asked him a few questions in an effort to get to know him a little bit better. I asked him what book he's reading right now. It is Nelson Mandela's biography. And I asked him where he likes to go on vacation. And he said he loves the beach. He goes to the Outer Banks of North Carolina and Virginia. We are especially thrilled to have him today because he did have some flight problems yesterday and had to drive up from Chicago. So we thank him for his efforts and I want to welcome him to Green Bay, Kevin Blackstone. I remember my first, the first column I, write, I, I wrote right off the bat um, uh, was about a uh, discrimination lawsuit that involved a recently fired coach of the Denver Nuggets and he was he was suing um, the owners of the Denver Nuggets who were fairly new um, and who at the time were the first uh, black owners of an NBA team. Um, in fact, they were the first black owners of a major professional um, sports team in the country, or at least managing partners, uh, to be more accurate. Um, and I found that whole dynamic to be uh, uh, pretty ironic and pretty interesting, and I wrote about it and people immediately told me, don't write about this kind of stuff anymore in the sports page because we don't want to hear about it. And I've been writing about it uh, ever since. Um, so, uh, so much for that. Um, one of the things about, uh, uh, about my examination of sports as a sports columnist um, was to try and bring some importance to race and, and sports, in part to I kind of think to answer my own doubts about what my mentor told me when I let him know that I was going to go over to the sports page. And I didn't really want to get lost in the shuffle. And I did really want to point out that sports was um, uh, particularly important. Of course, we, we know all the names when it comes to race and sports. You know, we know about Muhammad Ali, and we've heard about Jackie Robinson and Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis. But I think the important thing is to think about what they really mean. Because I don't think that over the last century or 125 years, let's say, that there has been a stronger magnifying glass in this country um, on an issue that has broiled on forever than the magnifying glass of sports has put on race. Um, you can go back to the turn of the century or right around the World War I era, and you can look at the stories of Jack Johnson, who was the first black man who not only became heavyweight champion in this world, but was allowed to fight for the heavyweight championship in this world. And you can read the copy that was written in the biggest newspapers in this country, be they in New York, be they in the Los Angeles Times, 
the Chicago Tribune at the time and read the thoughts of what people had about Jack Johnson and what he meant to society. He was challenging every notion that people thought about black men in this society, and not just of what white people thought about black men in this society, but just as importantly, what black men thought about themselves in this society. Because there's one thing I've learned about sports, one thing I've come to believe about sports is that sports has become a prism through which people see other people of color in this country and through which people of color see themselves in this country. Um, for a long time, there was always a great divide. Um, and to some extent, I think that still exists today between races once we, um, once we go home, uh, once we go to worship over the weekend. Um, there's a great divide. I was, uh, I was on a panel with um, Steve James uh, a couple of months ago. Steve James is the documentary filmmaker who made Hoop Dreams, um, which was until Michael Moore came along, um, the highest grossing uh, documentary film ever made in the United States. Uh, and I was on a panel with him because he had just done a, um, a uh, 30 for 30 um, documentary for ESPN on the trial and tribulations of Allen Iverson, who happened to hail from his hometown of Hampton, Virginia, um, and his rival high school um, in Hampton, Virginia called uh, Bethel High School. And uh, Steve James played sports in high school growing up. Uh, and he was um, uh, one of the few white players on his team at the time. And he made, I thought, a really interesting observation during the film and during his talk and he said that um, it was one thing to have black teammates. It was another thing to have black friends. He said because he only knew his black teammates and they only knew him from the time they spent together practicing and the time they spent together competing in games. He didn't know them beyond that because he never went to their home and they never went to his home. And it didn't really dawn on him until later, as he was starting to examine this whole um, uh, narrative of Allen Iverson growing up in Hampton, Virginia, and going through this very racially charged um, uh, assault case uh, that led to a five-year prison sentence for Allen Iverson that was eventually um, overturned by a pardon from Governor, uh, Governor Wilder, um, that he never really thought about that. But much of that is the case in sports, is that it provides that prism through which he saw his teammates, they saw him, and maybe even to an extent that they saw themselves. Um, that's what sports does. And so it, it's true at the turn of the century with people like Jack Johnson, who challenged the very notions of what black men were and are in this country. Um, it happened uh, as we went into the 20s and 30s with other black athletes, particularly uh, Joe Lewis, Jesse Owens. It happened with them. They turned the prism around. Um, who would have thought uh, until Jesse Owens came along that a black man would be enlisted into the war overseas as part of as part of this country's argument against Hitler and against Nazism. It was something that would continue on through the 40s and 50s even with the Harlem Globetrotters being used in the Cold War. I don't think people thought about that for a very long time. Um, sports has been um, extremely important when it comes to looking at race in this country and how black folks have been treated. It was pretty interesting, I thought, that um, uh, a new book, well, a new book of just a couple of years ago, 
um, written by um, a couple people I've had the pleasure to meet now, now that I've been at uh, um, the University of Maryland, one being Hank Klibanoff, longtime journalist, uh, and the other being uh, uh, Gene Roberts, who for a long time was the uh, great editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. They wrote a book called uh, The Race Beat, which won Pulitzer Prize um, a few years ago. And the race beat was all on the people who covered the civil rights movement. Um, and they really went in depth. I mean, they talked to people who you wouldn't know about, particularly people at the black press. Um, and uh, they made the, uh, the finding um, that absolutely astounded me that the first time that black reporters and white reporters were allowed together to report on the same story was in 1947 when Jackie Robinson integrated baseball. Before that, everything was separate. Even covering the simmering civil rights movement throughout the South, black newspaper reporters did what they did, white newspaper reporters did what they did, and never the two met until 1947 when the press box open for the very first game uh, of a black man returning to professional baseball. Because of course one thing that always gets forgotten is that uh, this wasn't the integration of baseball, this was the reintegration of baseball because in the late 1880s uh, there was a black man playing baseball by the name of Moses Fleetwood Walker who was run out of the game by the general, gentleman's agreement that decided that no, no longer would anyone of African heritage be allowed to play the game. Um, so I found that to be very important. And the, the end result of that was that in the next year, the next year or two, um, finally black reporters were admitted into the House of Representatives and into the Senate to cover uh, daily legislative um, actions of this country. So once again, there was a time when the prism of sports was used to change the perception that white folks had of black folks and maybe even black folks had of themselves. Um, that they were able to do these other things that they always knew and always felt that they were um, able to do. A lot of people who are about my age in journalism, I think, consider themselves um, Watergate babies. Uh, I mentioned delivering that Washington Post on, on the morning that, uh, that uh, President Nixon resigned. I'm a part of that lineage as well. But I think my real lineage um, and what I try and bring to sports uh, goes back a few years earlier. Um, some of you may know that there was an Illinois governor by the name of Otto Kerner who um, in the late 1960s, um, after Milwaukee went up in flames and Chicago went up in flames and Newark went up in flames, was asked to chair uh, a commission to investigate how this could happen in America. And uh, just the other day, um, there was a, uh, uh, an obit in the paper, a guy by the name of David Ginsburg, I don't know if you noticed it, uh, but David Ginsburg was selected by Otto Kerner and by uh, President Johnson at the time to be the executive director of the Kerner Commission report. And the Kerner Commission report basically found that, um, uh, that the reason for the uprising in urban America at the time uh, was systemic racism that had been growing for years and had been festering in the black communities. And the reason nobody knew about it was because of us, the media. Uh, we hadn't reported it. Um, we had no barometer for it. Um, if the black press was paying attention to it, the white press wasn't, because the white press was virtually uh, all white at the time. One of the suggestions from the current commission report written by David Ginsburg was that the media had to start reflecting the rest of the country and had, through this reflection, would have to start employing people who could better provide the insight that was necessary uh, to understand what was going on. That's one of the things I try and bring to sports reporting. 
Um, I pointed out when I started writing a column in 1990, so not that long ago, although it seems like an eons, eons to me, um, there were only four other black sports reporters or sports columnists. So there were only four other sports columnists who were interpreting for the rest of the world, as well as for athletes, who were predominantly black when you talk about basketball and football, and were slowly but surely becoming predominantly uh, athletes of color in baseball. Um, there were only four who were interpreting for everyone what black athletes were feeling, what other athletes of color were feeling for the very, very first time. That's just 20 years ago. To me, that is, that is astounding. Um, but that was the task that I think a lot of us understood that we had and we um, adopted it. Um, we wanted to give voice to those who previously didn't feel comfortable sharing their voice. And I think you've seen a lot more of that going on now. Um, despite the uh, collapse of the newspaper industry, um, and when I say collapse of the newspaper industry, I'm really talking about the print product. Um, despite that collapse, there are more and more um, uh, columnists of color now uh, talking about the opinions of black athletes and black coaches and other people of color in sports. Uh, there are more women um, who are picking up the mantle uh, for women in sports or the lack of them. Uh, and the same goes for um, people of Latin American descent, um, people who consider themselves Hispanic. A lot more of that is going on too. Uh, and so I think that the importance of race in sports is once again being underscored by this new um, journalistic movement, I think, of the last 20 years, something that has slowly been developing um, in the news pages uh, elsewhere for some time. We finally caught up um, a little bit. Uh, we have a problem right now because so much sports reporting and sports opinion writing is moving from newspapers or mainstream media over to new media, the internet, dot coms, like what I work for now, AOL Fan House, and I'm not so certain that a lot of these new entities have the same sensitivity to these subjects um, as newspapers are forced to have for quite some time. There's some pressure that has to be uh, brought to bear upon, um, uh, upon the dot com internet uh, industry, and I know that Gary Howard, who is the executive sports editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, is trying to uh, do just that as the new uh, head of the uh, Associated Press Sports Editors Association. Um, but it's 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 critical um, that that get done. One of the reasons I'm going to South Africa um, next month is not because of the World Cup. Uh, I love the World Cup. I've done a few World Cups before. I like soccer. I do believe that it is, 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 in fact, quote, the beautiful game. But the reason I'm going is because of the setting. Um, never before has an African nation, never before has uh, a, a second world country with dibs on the first world hosted a global sporting event. Never before has a black governing body pulled off what South Africa is going to attempt to pull off um, uh, next month. And with the backdrop of Mandela, with the backdrop of what sports meant to apartheid in South Africa, um, when I saw this on the calendar, I circled it. I said, I don't care what I'm doing, I've got to go there, uh, either as a fan or hopefully as somebody to write about uh, what's going to be unveiled there. Um, some of you may have seen the movie Invictus uh, about the, uh, the rugby team in South Africa uh, when uh, Nelson Mandela got out of prison. Um, sports has been, I don't know if you've been to South Africa or know any South Africans, but 
but South Africans are about as rabid about sports as we are in this country, probably even more so. Um, and uh, uh, it is not lightly that I say this, um, because obviously you had a, an armed struggle uh, to bring about freedom to the indigenous people of South Africa, um, but sports also played a huge role, I think, in uh, forcing change in South Africa. Um, back in the 1960s, uh, there was a movement started um, in sporting, in the global sporting community to, uh, to um, shun South Africa when it came to global sporting events. Um, they got run out of the national, international rugby tournament. Um, eventually, they got run out of the Olympics. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of people in South Africa were very, very hurt by that. Um, and I think that international pressure combined with what, uh, with, with what the indigenous people of South Africa were doing to struggle for their freedom um, had a lot to do with finally bringing forth some change there. Um, and that's why Evictus becomes uh, such an interesting movie. That's why a uh, project that a good friend of mine who's a documentary filmmaker down in uh, uh, Chicago is working on, which he calls Robin Island Singers, uh, which is about a trio of, um, of, uh, uh, of men who were in prison with, with Nelson Mandela at Robin Island and were also athletes and became singers, is a very fascinating project. And I encourage you to check it out at www.robinislandsingers.com. I'm not getting any money for it. I'm just telling you it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting um, uh, endeavor by Jeff Spitz. Um, so sports everywhere has been a very, very powerful influence on change. It has forced people to look at themselves differently. It has forced others to look at people who participate in sports differently. It has, in fact, I think, you know, when you look at the civil rights movement, um, the civil rights movement was an orchestrated human drama with a purpose. And it worked. But sports has been an orchestrated and spontaneous movement towards change on racial issues, and it too has worked. That's why I'm very comfortable writing about sports now. That's the argument that I made to my mentor who turned his nose up and walked away when he heard I was going to sports. Um, and that's the reason for conferences like this today, where people are comfortable talking about this very, very um, prickly uh, issue. Um, it hasn't gone away. Uh, it's not going to go away. And next month in South Africa, certainly for the first week, when people are trying to put the World Cup in some kind of context, uh, it's going to take stage um, front and center. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm much better answering questions than trying to talk about something and, and uh, get you to encourage them. I always feel odd as a journalist because uh, my job has always been to, uh, to ask questions and listen to what people say rather than uh, listen to myself talk and then have people ask me questions. But I'd like to turn it around to you now. I'm open for anything. I noticed, uh, and I don't know if you did this intentionally or not, but you referred to Washington's NFL franchise instead of Washington Redskins. First of all, was that intentional? If so, can you speak about that and whether that name you think will ever change? Um, yeah, it was intentional. Um, I've gotten in the, uh, in the habit um, over the last 10 years or so since I've been writing um, and trying to encourage the, uh, the team to change its name, which is... Um, abjectly racist, um, to not use the name. Um, uh, in my class, I even bring in a, uh, a friend of mine who's a uh, DC rapper um, who has a rap song about forcing the name change um, to talk about the use of, uh, 
of um, of of American Indian names um, and derogatory nicknames um, as slogans. Um, back in the 1960s, my my father <clears throat> and some of his friends, um, uh, as you you might know, Washington's NFL team was the last to um, to uh, integrate in the NFL, and the only reason it finally did. Um, was because uh, the federal government paid for most of the new stadium at the time, which was then D.C. Stadium, later became RFK Stadium. And they said that unless you integrate your team, you're not going to be allowed to play in this new stadium. And so George Preston Marshall, um, who was um, trying to hold on to the, uh, the southern market of the, NF the burgeoning NFL, which he owned, um, begrudgingly um, traded the rights to the number one draft pick, which would have been Ernie Davis, who of course died tragically, to the Cleveland Browns for Bobby Mitchell. And uh, thus the Redskins had their first, their first, uh, sorry, that was a Freudian slip, uh, had their first uh, uh, black player. And uh, uh, story has it, legend has it, that uh, uh, Bobby Mitchell was invited to this big um, banquet that that uh, George Preston Marshall would have every year uh, to introduce the team. And uh, part of the tradition was to stand up and sing Dixie. And uh, uh, Bobby Mitchell was a little taken aback, but George Preston Marshall apparently encouraged him, stand up, stand up and sing the song. Well, they used to play, um, play Dixie um, as part of the repertoire the band did uh, with the team. And my father uh, finally uh, wrote a letter to the president of the team at the time, uh, who was uh, Edward Bennett Williams, a great lawyer, and, uh, and asked him not to um, uh, insult part of the fan base and ticket buyers by playing the song, which uh, caused a lot of discomfort and some anger in the stands. And uh, Edward Bennett Williams agreed, and they stopped playing the song. Um, and now I just wish they would. Uh, they would change the name because I think it's a, uh, I don't think it is, it's an insult. Hi, um, I had a question uh, regarding um, racial issues um, in relation to the NBA. Um, I've recently read and it's been an observation, um, a lot of teams like to create and structure their team based on what the fans want. Mm -hmm. And it was pointed out that the Utah Jazz, in one of the most homogeneous markets in pro sports, have um, consistently had the whitest team in the NBA. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on, on that issue, as well as um, the import of European players, which is lightening the league, if you will, um, and whether you think that is deliberate by the NBA, and it seems, um, it's been suggested in articles that that, that has come after the big um, fight at uh, the Palace in Auburn Hills, and um, the other issue is, you know, the, the dress code issue, um, where, you know, African American players are, or all players, rather, are required to wear a certain right. dress at the game. Can you address that issue? Yeah, I'll, write a, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the second one first, the dress code issue. And when David Stern, who's my, probably my favorite commissioner, um, uh, simply because he's, uh, uh, he's, he's so accessible and, um, and gives out great, great quotes, um, and I think he's a good commissioner. Uh, when he uh, came down with his dress code, uh, I wrote a column and called it Cultural Imperialism. And uh, I, I still believe that. Um, uh, I didn't know that people were so interested in what basketball players wore to and from their place of employment or if they were sitting on the bench unable to play because of injury. And uh, I think that clearly um, David Stern was trying to um, dress his players uh, in a manner that he thought was going to be more appealing to uh, corporate sponsors. At the same time, uh, I thought it was very disingenuous because while he was trying to dissuade his players from dressing in the image of their generation, which is the hip hop culture, um, 
if you go into any NBA arena, the music that you're going to hear is hip hop. The dancers are going to dance in a hip hop style. And if ever you go to an NBA All-Star Weekend, it may as well be a hip hop entertainment convention. Um, so on the one hand, he's trying to divorce his players from that. On the other hand, he has his hand out and he's taking as much money as he can from, from that particular community, right down to investors like Jay-Z and Nelly, who are part owners of, of teams. So um, I was uh, particularly disturbed by that. And of course, that came on the heels of the fact that David Stern also um, uh, uh, unilaterally um, uh, went out not too long after the malice at the palace, as it became known, uh, and tapped uh, Matthew Dowd, um, uh, the GOP image maker, on the shoulder and asked him to come in and, and help him redo the image of the NBA. Uh, the other owners stood up and told him, uh, thank you, but no thank you, we don't, we don't need that. Um, as far as the white players issue, uh, it's been going on for quite some time. Um, uh, you know, I think um, uh, I was just watching, um, I think it was the Magic Bird um, documentary uh, that uh, talked about the importance of Larry Bird being white and what had become virtually an all black league and what that meant, how he tried to distance himself from that issue. Um, and they interviewed uh, fans um, in, in this piece, uh, white fans who said that they would like to see more white players, they can identify with them, and that's one of the reasons it's great to see, um, to see Larry Bird. Um, if, if it is true that Utah and the evidence seems suggested wants to put together a team uh, that reflects its community more so than um, than anything else. Um, then I would be a little bit disturbed if I were a Utah Jazz fan, and that meant, and it doesn't necessarily mean this, but that meant that you were going to have a more difficult time achieving the ultimate goal, which is winning a championship, than you otherwise would. Um, I would be disturbed by that. Um, uh, then again, um, I know that uh, I remember when my parents moved across the district line when I was a child into this neighborhood that was um, where black folks were finally moving that there was a family across the street that uh, um, uh, where an older woman was, li was living, it was a white family, and, and uh, uh, she had some, some health distress one night and the ambulance came. And when the ambulance, when the paramedics happened to be black, and I remember that she refused service from the uh, black paramedic. So in that context, I think that's, I think that's very possible. Um, I think it's unfortunate. But on the other side of the coin, there was also the, I remember when the New York Knicks went, became an all black team. I don't, I don't know if it was by design or just by happenstance, but that also became a, um, that also became a big story. Um, and a lot of people have talked about the influx of, of European players and what that means in terms of, in terms of lightening the league or whitening the league. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, most owners are more interested in, in winning. And I'm actually less concerned about that and more concerned about the fact that the NBA still has in its bosom an owner like Donald Sterling with the Clippers, who not only is a bad owner, but also a bad person who has paid some of the um, highest fines for housing discrimination lawsuits in this country. Um, so I'm actually more concerned about that than, than that other issue. Race, race and sports, racial, racial issues. I must ask you, to you, what is race? Well, race is debatable. I mean, I remember in college reading, uh, uh, I can't remember whose text it is, it argued that race doesn't exist, that it's just a construct of society. Um, 
uh, I think race does exist, and I think it's a construct of society. I think we only look at uh, uh, we only look at have to look at President Obama to understand that. Um, you know, here is someone who is um, whose parentage is both black and white, um, whose upbringing was uh, was virtually all white, who um, stated in one of his books that he had to learn how to become black, who nonetheless has been um, uh, has been grasped by the black community, um, uh, who um, interestingly enough uh, on his uh, census survey uh, indicated that he was black when very well he could have he could have checked his mother's race. Um, after all, she did rear him. Um, so I think that you know I think that race definitely exists, no matter what the definition uh, you want to put on it, whether or not it's biological or um, sociological. It is undeniable um, in in this country, and so we have to wrestle with it and deal with it every day. Um, I mean, if you are black, chances are you suffer from unemployment, health concerns, uh, housing concerns, uh, educational concerns, more so than anybody else, period. Um, we can explore the reasons to that, but that's, that's a truth. And so, so I think it's, I, I think that people who try to say that it doesn't exist or that we've somehow entered in, into this post-racial society now, um, I think are looking at things through rose-colored glasses. I was listening to uh, Mike and Mike talk a few months ago about the- Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, about the punishment of Ben Roethlisberger. Right. And it seemed that uh, from no matter what angle they looked at it, um, race seemed to perpetrate um, the punishment. Like if you thought that he uh, skidded by, right. then they looked at cases like uh, Michael Vick or Dante Stallworth, and oh, if he was a black quarterback, he would have been uh, suspended for the whole season. And then if um, they thought that he didn't uh, get enough, then, um, well, he didn't. Uh, Right. It was because well, race is going to be the determining factor exactly, in his punishment. Exactly, no matter what. Um, do you think that a um, the league did enough to distance himself from the racial issue um, in deciding the ultimate punishment? And um, b, do you think that this is something that um, no matter what, when dealing with um, the punishment of future players that um, break lead conduct? Um, the, that race, whether they're white, black, Hispanic, Chinese now, we have a Chinese right. offensive tackle. Um, do you think that that's something that um, the media or the league will always like be surrounded by? Well, I think, um, you know, anytime you have something like that happen, it's, uh, uh, and you have the, the, the backdrop of Michael Vick and Pac-Man Jones and Tank Johnson and plenty of others, um, that the issue of race is going to come up. Uh, you know, black folks react to issues like that and say, you know, if he was black, he'd be run out of the league. Look what happened to Michael Vick. Um, and white folks may say, not so fast. Michael Vick was charged and convicted of a federal crime, and that's why he had to do time. Um, that hasn't happened with Ben Roethlisberger. Um, a good friend of mine is um, uh, is uh, an attorney who happened to be in, happened to been representing Ben Roethlisberger. He's kind of a crisis attorney, I guess you could say. And I know from him that there was considerable um, concern in the commissioner's office about how much punishment to dole out to Roethlisberger to squash any concerns 
um, that he would be getting off because he was white, but at the same time, not making him have to pay for sins that he didn't commit, um, as did some black athletes. Um, what they came up with, I think, is it was more than I expected, um, but I also think it was fair. Um, and uh, it gives Rossesburger an opportunity to um, uh, uh, to prove he's going to be a changed person. Um, but that's not, but because race is such a heavy issue, it's just not that easy to explain away. Um, I'm a dog lover. Uh, I have, um, I had no, uh, no problems with what happened to Michael Vick. Um, I wrote about Michael Vick and talked about him on NPR several times and, you know, I reminded, uh, black folks who were so certain otherwise that, um, the penalty that Michael Vick got was not the biggest of any, um, uh, of any, uh, uh, abuser of dogs, um, through dog fighting in this country. Um, it wasn't just a black thing. It wasn't just a southern thing. Uh, the guy who's in jail for the most time for fighting dogs is from upstate New York, and he's white. Um, a lot of people didn't know that, didn't realize that, didn't pay attention to that. Um, you know, Michael, what Michael Vick did was, uh, uh, was uh, horrific. Um, he paid his time. Uh, he's out. Um, he so far has continued to show that he understands what he did and is out preaching almost every weekend without cameras following him, without reporters following him, telling kids, don't do what I did, and trying to help the humane uh, society. So, you know, race is a difficult thing to get away from in those types of issues. But I think that Rossesberger and Michael Vick were both handled fairly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.